All right, everyone, um, we're going to get started. So this is the last Ecology Center seminar of the, the year, the academic year. Um, so yeah, so today we have Dr. Dio Ashinubi with us today. He's an avian behavioral ecologist. He's done a lot of work on how environmental conditions and environmental change influences uh, avian behavior and physiology. He got his degrees, his master's from the Leventus Ornithological Research Institute in Nigeria, and then his PhD at the University of Canterbury in New Zealand. Um, uh, Dio's work has spanned boundaries in uh, multiple dimensions, so he's lived and, and worked all over the world. Uh, and also his work spans conservation science, management, policy, and education realms. Uh, Dio has worked for uh, a bunch of NGOs, conservation organizations, traditional uh, academic research organizations, uh, and has coordinated a lot of uh, conservation uh, programs and, and working groups also associated, uh, for example, with the United Nations. Currently, Dio is at the Fitzpatrick Institute of African Ornithology. Uh, and we're grateful to have him here today to share his expertise on uh, migration in the, in, in Three Kings. Uh, so please help me welcome Dr. Dio Ashinubi. Thanks, Erica. Uh, okay, can everyone hear me? Is the recording good? Okay, good. Uh, so I um, thanks to everyone who came yesterday and everyone who's back here today. I thought I'd show a little team spirit. Uh, thank you. <laughs> and uh, yes, yeah, so um, yesterday's talk was a bit more of a broad overview looking at migration. Today, I want to talk about some of my work now. Um, so this is, um, we kind of looked at the uh, intra, we kind of look at intra-African migration, and one of our star species uh, is the woodland uh, kingfisher. And uh, before sort of uh, jumping into things, uh, I, yesterday I talked a little bit about myself and the things that I've done, uh, but uh, today, I would like to give credit to a number of people uh, who have made it possible to have this work uh, that I'm speaking about today. Um, the first two are uh, Professor Peter Ryan and um, Professor Phoebe Barnard. Uh, Professor Peter Ryan, uh, Peter, uh, he was the director of the Fitzpatrick Institute uh, when I was brought in. And Phoebe was the one who sort of headhunted me and brought me in. And they were both my PIs uh, on this project. And they gave me a lot of trust in, in terms of how to set up the project and run with it. Um, and I, I remember that um, after my first field season, I come back and I'm sort of talking to Peter and giving him the rundown of how everything went. And he was working and I was sort of interrupting him and he's sort of working and he stops and he's looking at me and he's looking at me over his glasses and I'm done. And he stops and he goes, Dio, I did not need to hear any of that. And I'm sort of taken aback. I'm like, oh, oh really? It was like, there was no problem you couldn't solve. You didn't kill anybody. You know, like, I, you're okay. You're here because you're an independent researcher. Get on with it. When you have a problem that you can't solve, come back to me. And I did exactly that. Um, so we started the project in 2015. And we worked, myself with literally an army of people, um, we worked right through till about 2020. And this is the work that I wanna share with you today. Now, the genesis of this work sort of started back when I was working for CMS, spoke about that yesterday, and BirdLife International. And uh, my work was uh, developing the um, AIMLAP, that is the Africa Eurasia Migratory Land Birds Agreement. And one of the biggest gap, knowledge gaps that we discovered in terms of migratory birds was those that moved within continents. So we know a lot about those that move between continents. So the Neoctic, uh, Neoctic migration, Palearctic migration, awesome. But those that moved within continents, species that were just limited to one continent and migrated within such, I found out that we actually had little knowledge about them. And um, 
I naturally turned my attention to Sub-Saharan Africa, um, where I'm from. I'm from Nigeria. And uh, started sort of thinking about what kind of questions we can ask and, and, and try to answer and how to sort of play with it. And these four questions around variation, uh, phylogeography, phenology, and connectivity kind of rose uh, to, the, uh, to, to the surface. We worked on a number of different species, but um, the star of the show was the woodland kingfisher. So that's the one I'm sort of going to talk about. Um, but anyone that is, um, for those that have sort of done background work and looked at things that have been published, you will know that um, there are publications about, say, for example, the Africa pygmy kingfisher. Uh, we've done some work on cuckoos as well. Um, but today, we'll just keep it to the woodland uh, kingfisher. So just to move things along, here's the star of the show. This is a video. Um, if you're interested in how long it takes for woodland kingfishers to copulate in the wild, start the clock, wait for it, wait for the tail to go in. There's a female in there, by the way. Um, wait, start the clock right about, come on, buddy, now. So, um, they are cavity nesters, as you can see, and um, unlike woodpeckers, they don't sort of peck away and make their own nest. Uh, that was 11 seconds for those that were trying to keep track. And um, this, this is kind of a lot of fun things. When you spend time with these beautiful birds out there in the wild, um, you just get to play with things. Um, we did find a couple of natural cavities, but um, we also did put up nest boxes. And I'll just sort of mention that uh, at, the, at the end. Um, so the woodland kingfisher, the entire, uh, the global range is limited to the African continent. Um, however, there are three subspecies. So the Senegalensis, the Fusiopelius, and the Cyanoleuca. Uh, so I'm just gonna trace this. So this uh, solid black line, that is the range of the Senegalensis. This dotted is the range of the Fusiopelius. And here is the range of the Cyanoleuca. So they do overlap. And that makes it can it can get quite confusing uh, because they kind of look they kind of look alike. Now, based on what we think we know, the Fusiopelius is probably uh, the entire subspecies is probably uh, comp probably comprises uh, resident individuals. The Senegalensis comprises both resident populations and migrant populations great study species, uh, well, subspecies in this case. And the Cyanoleuca, exactly the same. And this part of the world, we kind of play with how messy is gonna get because we've got these three subspecies kind of uh, coming uh, together in, in the same uh, uh, space. In terms of our study sites, uh, one of the things that we tried to do was identify areas where we could work with local organizations. Um, capacity development was something that was important to us. Uh, so I was based in South Africa in Cape Town, uh, but the field site was up in Limpopo, uh, in the Limpopo province. And I was collaborating with researchers at uh, SAMBI, uh, the, at the uh, National Zoological Gardens. And over there, we had the biobank. So all the data, all the tissue samples that, was, that were collected right across the range, everything ended up in South Africa. And that was where a lot of the processing was done. Um, in, uh, and uh, the birds, so the Cyanoleuca, that subspecies, would breed sometime between, they would arrive around say October and they would leave around say March, April. Um, so our study, uh, our study period in Southern Africa was November to January. That was when we'll head out to the field and do field work right about there. In Uganda, um, we would head to the field, say, July to August. And we worked with UWEC, that's the um, Ugandan Wildlife Education uh, Center, as well as Makerere uh, University. 
in West Africa, um, we were in West Africa between May and June. Um, we had uh, we worked across two countries, Nigeria and Ghana. And uh, in Nigeria, we worked with the AP Leventist Ornithological Research Institute, where I got my master's. And in um, in Ghana, we worked with the Ghana Wildlife Society as well as the uh, Cape Coast uh, University. Now, this is. Still a, bit, a little bit of a buildup, but um, I talked about the biobank in South Africa. So we did need to capture the birds. So we were not just doing uh, field observations and looking at them. We had to get these birds and we had to sort of capture them. And um, there's a verse of scripture that I love and it managed, I managed to fit this verse of scripture into my PhD thesis uh, because there was, I was working on the yellow breasted boo boo at that time, and that was a bird that was difficult to capture. And if that bird sees you putting up the mist net, forget it. You're not going to capture the bird. It'll just keep flying over the net and whatnot. I thought that was going to be the hardest bird to catch. No. <laughs> the woodland kingfisher put me through my paces to the point that I started coming up with amazing net arrays. So this is what I call the double-decker T-shaped net array in which I am using six mist nets. And um, it helped. <laughs> There's still a method paper penned in. I'm supposed to publish um, something along this because what many people tend to use is a pulley system to get the nets to go up that high. But yeah, that was a lot of fun. So what I'm going to do very quickly is just show you two videos of a successful um, capture. What you don't see in that video is the fact that uh, we had put up a nest box and that bird was um, a pair were nesting in the box and we literally had to put the mist net right in front of the nest box, honestly. And first we kind of, we had about, um, there was say like a two, three meter distance. This bird flew around the mist net and still got into the net. And we just thought, okay, gloves are coming off. And we put it right in front of the mist net, uh, right in front of the nest box, and we got that. So that was a lot of work. Now, here's the second one. The first one was in South Africa. This one is in Ghana. That's it. The excitement in my voice, it's, it just does not compute because um, it's, it is a lot of work and the whole team is there just out there to catch one bird. Uh, it's not just, that's not just what we employed. We also used uh, spring traps and with the spring traps, we baited these. Um, so th this is about uh, one foot, uh, a, a foot by a foot. And we use uh, superworms. Um, it's the larvae of a particular uh, beetle to, to bait them. And um, I don't have the video of this. I truly wish I did. But in Uganda, there was one kingfisher that figured out how to fly in, take the worm without tripping the net. With, I, I just, these birds are super smart and they absolutely have my respect. So over, Four years or so, this was what we were able to do with woodland uh, kingfishers. So we were able to trap 10 of them in Ghana. We were not able to trap any in Nigeria. Uh, we did get 12 in Uganda, and we were able to uh, sort of have uh, 58 trapped in South Africa, um, of which 17 were leap traps. Now, the reason why we were able to get that number in South Africa is because um, because I was based at the university in South Africa, um, at the start of every field season, I would uh, get the university, uh, the bucky, the, the pickup truck, and load it with 
so much equipment that people thought that I was going to war or something. So we had uh, we had the, the 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 what's its name, the spring traps and the mist nets. But we also did go with the nest boxes, which we would have set earlier for the birds to sort of start using. And that's really why it's not because the South African birds are easier to trap or anything like uh, anything of that nature. All right. Uh, once the bird is trapped, we ring to them. We did uh, use uh, metal rings. Because we were working across um, Africa, we tried to respect the ringing schemes of the different countries. So when we were in Uganda, we used the East African ringing scheme and we used their rings. When we were in West Africa, it was the rings there that we used and in South Africa, we did the same, but all the information was entered into SAFRING, the South African uh, ringing scheme, which serves for the whole of Africa. We also color ringed um, individuals because with the woodland kingfisher, when they are perched, um, you can actually see the tarsus. And that meant that it was easy to identify uh, individuals uh, before we begin that operation of trying to capture, uh, capture them. When we catch a bird, um, as you can see, there's a lot that we need to get through very quickly. So um, as a team, we learn to function very, very quickly and very quietly so that we don't stress the bird too much. Uh, so first thing, of course, is to ban the bird. And then we take the metrics and uh, then we score the feathers, the, 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 the primary feathers. Uh, then we score the body. And then we took, uh, we took um, feather samples from the primaries, the secondaries, and the, the tail feathers, the outermost uh, tail feathers. Um, we did take blood from the brachial uh, vein. Um, and this was uh, stored in buffer uh, on the filter paper. And we also would prepare a blood smear. And then there's also a cloacal uh, swab. Then the geolocator was placed on the bird. And then we took photos, starting with the photo of the data sheet and then photos of the bird. I can say, thankfully, that no bird throughout the entire, during the four years that we did this, no bird died in the hand uh, from stress. Uh, we did learn how to become very efficient in how we processed uh, the birds. But again, this is thanks to the team that I worked with. Everyone that went out with me, we sort of trained and trained and retrained what we were going to do. So when we were out in the field, it kind of went like a clockwork. All right. So now let's, uh, let's jump into the four research questions that we tried to sort of uh, play with. So the first is a uh, variation. We wanted to look at variation between the birds in Ghana, Uganda, and South Africa. Um, starting with the morphology. Now, um, the cyanoluca, the one, the bird that breeds in South Africa. If you do have the bird in the hand or you have a photo of it, it has this eye stripe behind the that just runs behind the eye that the Senegalensis, they don't have that. So that is one quick surefire way to tell whether you're looking at a Senegalensis or a Cyanoluca. Uh, the Fusiopelius, which I am not sure if we actually ever encountered, we're not sure about that. We can't say no for certain. They're a little bit darker, um, but sometimes when you look at the juvenile, um, it's some, it can be confusing. Are you looking at a, unless you see the bill. Um, so adults have a, oops, see, okay, good. I'm going to switch. Um, adults, adults have a red, um, upper bill and the black, uh, lo um, um, lower bill, but the young ones, it's kind of dark across, but if you don't see this, it's uh, sometimes can be a little confusing whether you're looking at a juvenile Senegalensis or maybe it's a Fusiopelius. Uh, that sort of came up a bit. Um, we did uh, one of the publications, um, and I do believe that uh, some people here reviewed uh, this uh, paper and discussed it. Um, one of the things we found out, uh, just looking at the morphometrics, was that the um, Cyanoluca. Uh, individuals, male and female, did tend to be maybe a little larger, a little uh, uh, heavier than, say, the uh, Senegalensis, particularly those that were trapped in, um, in Ghana. Uh, again, 
we have still play, there's still so much that we, uh, that we don't know. Um, another variation that I'll just share with you very quickly is vocalization. Um, this is from preliminary data. Doing it again, just a quick second. I'm gonna go back. There we go. Let's try this again. There we go. So this is the call of one bird, just one woodland kingfisher. And you have that initial, and then the, so we um, took recordings, uh, we, we, we would make field recordings uh, across South Africa, Uganda, and Ghana. But um, one of the things that I forgot or failed to mention when we were trapping the birds is that we would use playbacks. So when we arrived at the field site, before we start trapping, we would kind of run around and do all our bioacoustics work, all our recording. The reason why we did this is so that we, when we start trying to trap the birds and we're using playbacks, we don't want to influence the natural call rate of the birds because we've kind of stimulated them with this artificial playback and we don't know yet what that is doing to them. So a lot of this was um, in most cases before we start trapping not always um and just playing with preliminary uh data because there's a lot of recordings that we still haven't started sorting our way through um we looked at the duration of the call so that is from the start of the right till the end that is what we call the call duration and then the trill duration is the duration of each trill that's the each trill had to be sort of measured in, in time. And then we also looked at the number of trills. And we found a pattern that we sort of thought was quite interesting, which is that the South African uh, birds tended to call either, either have shorter calls or shorter number of trills or a shorter trill duration than the, um, than the Ugandan and the Ghanaian um, birds. Now, there's quite a big, quite a wide variation um, with the Ghanaian birds. And this, um, we, we can't rule it out quite yet, but we're wondering whether the Fusiopelius, uh, we recorded some of these uh, individuals. Because again, when we do the recording, we haven't actually caught any birds. So we're just kind of recording every call that we hear. And the call of the woodland kingfisher is kind of the same right across all three subspecies. So we still need to tease that apart. So that is how much we sort of know in terms of variation, but we're really interested in going deeper and sort of teasing this out a little bit more. Phylogeography. Um, this is one of the benefits of, for me at least, this is one of the benefits of collaborating because I am not a geneticist. When I was in my PhD, yes, I did some work to um, sex um, my study species at the time, the yellow-breasted boo-boo, and we did need to sex the woodland kingfishers because they are sexually monomorphic, uh, but the geneticists at uh, Sanby, at the oopsie, at the National Zoological Gardens, they really came in and they really delivered uh, for me on this. So um, they, we looked at both mitochondrial and nuclear DNA, but in the with the mitochondrial uh, DNA, they found a big distinction uh, between the South African cyanoleuca and the others, which is obvious, it's a different subspecies. Uh, and then we kind of, um, they kind of played with it and looked at how they were sort of uh, classed, but, but the, how they were grouped. But for me, the best part, which I did not expect at all, but I was thankful that it happened, was they said that they could actually date when the, Senegal, when the Sinoluca split from the Senegalensis. And those who reviewed the paper would probably have read this part. And ba uh, basically the Cyanoleuca split from the Senegalensis 0.8 to 1.2 million years ago. 
And that was during the interpluvial period. Um, that's the dry period. So you have the pluvial when there was a lot of rain, and then you have the interpluvial when there wasn't much. And what you had was uh, forests and woodlands would contract um, at that time. And that was actually the last sort of great uh, interpluvial period uh, when we kind of look back. And that was what probably happened was uh, individuals of the woodland kingfishers were in the southern Africa part of the range when the interpluvial period happened and they got trapped over there and um, what's it called? Allopatric speciation and well, in this case, subspeciation. And uh, that's what we have now. And then there was a uh, what's um, uh, uh, another rainy season or period. And now we have the Cyanoleuca moving all the way past the equator and overlapping in range with the uh, the rest, uh, with the other subspecies. Uh, so for those interested, uh, this would probably be the paper you would be looking for. That details a lot of that. Uh, but there are other papers as well that look at... Um, uh, blood parasites in Afrotropical uh, land birds. Uh, and I think a lot of that was from much of the uh, data that we, uh, the, the tissue samples that we uh, collected, that we, were, that we were able to collect. The next bit that I'll sort of uh, move on to is phenology. And this is timing um, of arrival and departure. And what we were able to do is lean on citizen science data. Uh, so a lot of this data came from the SABAP2 data set. So we were focusing on the South African population. The SABAP2 data is uh, populated um, with sightings or reporting or records from South Africa, uh, Botswana, uh, Namibia. And uh, there's, it's a really impressive uh, citizen science uh, data set. And um, what uh, we were able to do was uh, for several <laughs> years, the, the data goes back, uh, I think at this point, it's about 11 years or so that it goes back. Uh, and um, I'm only going to show the years um, 2014, 2015, and 2016. And that is, I'm, I'll explain, 2016 was a drought year in South Africa. And what we observed in 2014, uh, this blue line is the um, expect, so the, 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 the charts above are just, I'm zooming in on the charts uh, below. So here is the expected, the blue line. And what happened in 2014 is that the birds arrived um, earlier and left later than expected. In 2015, they kind of arrived on time and kind of left on time. But in 2016, they arrived later than expected and left earlier than expected. So they had a shorter, a narrower uh, breeding period because they're coming into South Africa to breed. This is really interesting for us. And um, this is about as far as we've taken it so far. We are interested in um, how do the birds know what's going on in South Africa? Because uh, I, I, when, when we get to the connectivity, I'll, talk, uh, I'll be able to show you how far their, their wintering ground is. Um, and we did do some uh, telemetry work and tracking work, uh, but in these years, in 2014, that was, we didn't have uh, uh, geolocators on the birds. So we can't tell what we're sort of, the idea we're playing with right now is maybe we can take a look at NDVI data, maybe land use, land cover, and sort of pull that together right across their range and try to get an indication of what might uh, drive their movement patterns. We don't have anyone doing this work right now. So if anyone's bored and you have the necessary skill set, please do come. Uh, let's let's talk about it, uh, because all of this information is just sitting there in Sabat in, in the Sabat 2 uh, data set. And it's just growing year after year. Um, so 
I do not believe 2016 is the only drought year. So we can actually see if we can find a couple of drought years, see if we observe the same pattern, and then look at what kind of uh, land cover variation across Sub-Saharan Africa might be influencing uh, this. Yesterday, I did mention Walden warming. Um, and I said that um, one of the things, one, for, for me, one of my takeaways from this book um, is how much data exists, citizen science data exists um, around us. I mentioned yesterday that in the Limpopo area, they do love the woodland kingfisher and they have an annual lottery um, to, you, you get to say, okay, I think the first woodland kingfisher call in Limpopo is going to be heard on this date. So everyone throws their hat in the ring and then whoever wins gets the money. Now, we are convinced that that is awesome data that we can play with. Um, we don't have access to it yet, but um, what I'm hoping is that in what I, what I call the phase two or the second phase of the work on intra-African bird migration, we might also start looking at different kinds of data sources uh, for movement. So arrival dates and uh, departure dates. With that, connectivity, which is sometimes one of the most fun parts. So migratory connectivity, um, I did explain it yesterday using a different chart uh, or different um, imagery. And that is basically how, much, how connected one site is to another site. Um, if many of the individuals from one site migrate to another site and most of them migrate back or all of them migrate back to and um, this other site, you would say that there is strong mig migration connectivity between uh, two sites, for example, the yellow line. Um, but if they're kind of dispersing, it's kind of weaker in terms of the migration connectivity. Basically, you're just linking two sites and you're saying most of the birds here go here. And that does have conservation implications because if someone were to build a dam or a road or an airport at one of these sites, then basically when the individuals from here take off and head down, where are they gonna go now? Um, now they just sort of gotta disperse and, uh, disperse and figure themselves out. So this is actually something that we're still playing with. We are not there yet. Um, we did uh, with uh, support uh, from the uh, Swiss Ornithological uh, Institute, Vogelwater in, in Switzerland, in, in Sempark. They donated uh, geolocators to the study. And um, these are super cool uh, uh, geolocators. They only weigh 1.6 grams. The woodland kingfisher weighs between say 60 and, I mean, there's some chunky individuals that are maybe up to like 80, uh, 80 grams. So we could put geolocators on the uh on the woodland kingfishers um comfortably and um these uh, these uh, pamela loggers not they don't they didn't only just record light data as i explained yesterday these also record atmospheric pressure they record activity so the flapping of the wings of the birds they also record magnetism and we're able to put all of that together and um, we can say quite a lot about what these birds were doing. I am just going, uh, sorry, just to quickly add, um, the geolocators were um, deployed um, sort of using the leg loop harness. So it's kind of like the bird is wearing a backpack around its legs and it was generally quite secure. Uh, but uh, I would just, so this is sort of one bird with the, the oops, sorry, yep, with the geolocator, um, but with time, uh, it actually, the feathers do actually cover um, the, uh, the, the, even the light rod uh, sometimes, but when we looked at the data, it did not obscure the data in any way, so we know we're not actually well worried in that sense. So for those uh, interested in geolocator work, um, they, they, it's, it's different from satellite transmitters. Uh, you only get your data if you get the geolocator back. Uh, so before even deciding if we can do geolocator work on the bird, we had to first figure out if we can capture this 
individual back. So we were quite happy that we could use color rings on the woodland kingfishers, because when we were out, then we can sort of see a bird on a perch, look at the color ring, and look at all the individuals that we had uh, geolocators on, because sometimes we could not see the geolocator while the bird was um, flying or perched. Uh, but uh, the uh, we were able to deploy, oopsie, we were able to deploy about uh, 20, not about, we were able to deploy 28 uh, geolocators over the course of three years. Uh, we retrieved two in the first year, uh, that's 2017. Um, uh, and then we were able to confirm that two had lost their geolocators. So we trapped these birds, had them in the hand. They had no geolocators on them. So we don't know how they got out of the backpack, how they got rid of it, but Yes, uh, that part we're not quite sure of. And then, uh, so just to sort of summarize, we were able to get data from five uh, geolocators and all five geolocators had really good data that we can play with. And um, this is just sort of from one individual, a female. And we know it's a female because blood samples were taken and the bird was sexed uh, genetically. And, um, and in some cases we had uh, pairs that migrated. So all of this data, as I, as I speak to you, um, I am sort of finishing up the, the manuscript um, on this. And it's really interesting and it's fascinating, their movement patterns. Uh, I mentioned yesterday that they're solitary nocturnal migrants. So the pairs don't actually migrate together. Usually the female leaves uh, first. And we did not put geolocators on the young, on the chicks. Um, so right now we can't actually say we, we couldn't tell when the, um, the chicks left, if they leave with the mother, so to speak, or if they leave with the father, or if they just leave on their own. So that's still more questions that we wanna sort of play with. But um, just to make it easier to sort of read, um, the size of each dot is how long the bird sort of stayed at each site. And on the way up, they had sort of had um, stopover sites. On the way down, they just kind of belted and just um, just flew kind of straight down. Um, they would kind of stop, but because the way um, this was determined, if the bird stays in one site for three days or more, that is when it begins to register as a stopover site. And then it's how much longer then three days, the bird um, sort of stays. That's when you get a big one. So it's not that they didn't stay for say 24 hours or 48 hours at a site, but it needed to be longer than 72 hours for us to register it as a stopover as a stopover site. So I'll say stay tuned. Um, the the telemetry paper is. Um, in it's in the oven, still working on it. Um, and there's a, there's a lot of uh, really fascinating information sort of coming out. And our work on the telemetry builds on what uh, Warwick Tarbiton and his wife did back in 2014. They also deployed a number of geolocators. Um, they only got two records back, uh, two, two birds back. And this was a pair nesting in their sort of in the roof um they have they, had, they put up a nest box at their house uh, sort of in the roof and this pair came back and nested for about six years um until the male didn't come back anymore for some reason so we're assuming that the male might have died at some point in somewhere along the way um but they do come back they have high um, nest site fidelity, which is why we could consider putting uh, geolocators on them in the first place. And um, what we, from what, what um, uh, Warwick and, uh, and uh, Michelle sort of published, it does suggest that the male and the female do not even winter in the same place. Um, the data that we are seeing uh, kind of confirms this, speaks to this. So male and female kind of go to diff slightly different uh, wintering, wintering grounds. The geolocator they used only gave light data. The ones that we have, there's a lot more information. So the, 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 what we can sort of play with, the, the story that we can tell about the wintering ground is at a greater resolution and um, sort of 
excited about that. Um, the next bit about connectivity was um, is around stable isotopes. So focusing on the cyanoleuca, these birds are in South Africa. They migrate up north, they molt up there, and then they come back down. So um, for migrant birds, there are a lot of, there are a number, there are three key activities that happen every year. There is your migration, which is a great big journey. You're going and you're coming back. There is breeding, which also takes a lot of energy. And there is molt. And most birds will generally try not to overlap these three activities uh, because it does take, a, it takes a lot of energy to do each of them. So in these birds, it's, the, it's sort of very similar where they generally do not molt when they are migrating. They generally do not molt in the breeding ground. Their molting is done way up here. Uh, so we had um, uh, uh, so so this is sort of the uh, the isoscape for uh, sub-Saharan Africa, uh, looking at uh, deuterium, uh, carbon, and nitrogen. And uh, for those sort of interested, um, feathers on birds are generally. Uh, most birds tend to have 10 primaries and they are numbered from the inside sort of out. And the secondaries are kind of numbered sort of one, two, three going out the other way. So it kind of radiates um, outwards. And um, we, most when we, the birds that we trapped in South Africa all had really nice uh, primaries, all their feathers looked good. And that supports the idea that they had molted these feathers before they started their migration um, southward. And we did take feather samples from them. And um, I, oopsie. Uh, oh, I skipped that slide. Um, Abigail, um, one of the one, one of the, my master's students back in the day, um, her work was focused on this. And she was able to show that the isotopic signatures for the South African birds were very similar to the isotopic signatures of the Ugandan birds, which would, again, support the fact that these birds, the Sinaluka, they molt their feathers, um, or at least they pass through, and they, they're molting their feathers in, the, in an area similar to where the Ugandan birds are, which is basically East Africa. So, sort of, coming into a close, uh, rounding things up. In terms of next steps, um, we are focusing a lot of our attention on publishing. Uh, so a good number of papers have been published. There are still uh, papers yet to be published. And um, I will admit, um, writing papers, uh, manuscripts is not exactly my strongest suit, um, but I'm working with um, people much smarter than myself and who are more committed to um, publishing to get a lot of these papers out. We're trying to raise awareness through talks such as this and just engaging with people and getting many people more aware about the woodland kingfishers. And um, this issue of awareness um, is quite an interesting one um, because uh, it's not so much that we're trying to say to people, hey, look at this woodland kingfishers, because uh, we had this situation happen in Uganda in one of the, we were in one of these far-flung villages and we're trying to explain to one of the, uh, the people in the village, we were trying to describe the woodland kingfisher and he had no idea. And then I showed him a photo and he was like, oh, and then he called the name which was not ling. It, it was not uh, Luganda. It was not uh, the Lugandan language, and uh, and he was like, no, no, no. Our language. We have a name for the woodland kingfisher, and this is an historic language. Um, and we got so I got excited and I made some notes and whatnot. Um, I am not an anthropologist, so I do welcome anthropologists also um, at this point. Uh, but when let me say indigenous or even ancient cultures have a name for a particular species, it does suggest interaction with that species. So that species is considered important enough to give it a name, to call it something. And I don't know how, how but it would be interesting to also look at historic human wildlife interactions um, in this sort of regard. 
I don't know how what, what way, shape, or form that will take, but I'm certainly interested to talk about it if anyone has any ideas. Uh, fundraising is something that we would like to do. Um, as said, I maintain my research associate sort of hat or seat with the Fitzpatrick Institute in South Africa, um, and we would like to see this work um, sort of have a phase too, um, not just with the woodland kingfisher, but with many of the other species that we've studied, and maybe even many other more, where we can find other questions that people can sort of tap into. And like I said, we want to expand this. So we want to expand the network, the number of species, and the questions that we are looking at. So uh, in bringing things to a close, I would like to sort of leave you with one more video, which is uh, a nest box video. And it shows a woodland kingfisher coming into the nest. And uh, this particular individual was actually carrying a geolocator as, as well. And with that, I would like to once again say thank you very much for the honor of your time. Thank you. Thank you, Dial. Um, while everyone